again? I think we can begin. Good afternoon, everyone. So, so glad that you're here. And, you know, welcome to our workshop on disaster preparedness recovery. Um, my name is, is Karen Hagen, and I'm the Emergency Coordination Officer for the Agency for Persons with Disabilities. Um, and my co-presenter is Michael Taylor, who's the Regional Operations Manager for the Suncoast Region, headquartered in Tampa. Um, you know, we do this session every year at Family Cafe. We are so grateful to Family Cafe for holding this conference, both virtually and in person. Um, we truly believe this session and all the many, many workshops that they offer um, allows us to be, to learn, to be stronger. And of course, you know, Mike and I are very excited about this particular topic about preparing ourselves for disasters, especially the ones that can befall us in the state of Florida, because we know that we are much better off. And you know, one of the, one of the few things that has as high a return of investment as disaster preparedness, and that is that the amount of effort that we put into planning and working through what it is that we're gonna do pays off. Um, and it helps us, it helps our families, it helps our community. So um, we're really, really happy that you're here and joining us today. Um, it's been an interesting year, obviously, year, almost year and a half um, with COVID-19 as a public health emergency. And you know, when we think about disasters and emergencies that would befall us, who would have thought that we would have faced in the last year and a, and a half what we have faced? Um, a lot of lessons learned. Um, in fact, a lot of lessons learned that will make us stronger when we look at the kinds of other types of disasters that we see here in Florida. Um, and of course, hurricanes are what we think about most because that could be the most uh, catastrophic natural disaster that we might see. So I think a lot of planning, I know a lot of planning has gone into how are we gonna survive COVID-19. I, I do wanna say um, that I hope that you're okay. I hope that the people that you care about are okay. Um, it's been very difficult time, but we're here, you know, and we're moving forward and we are ready to prepare for this hurricane season, which began June 1st. So I'm going to turn it over to Michael. He and I are going to go back and forth um, to do in this session, and we're going to perhaps, you know, talk back and forth, add some things. Um, when we're done sharing these slides and our presentation with you, we'll open it up for questions and answers if you want to just talk about things. Um, but make this personal to you. Think about you, your family, those you care for, those you care about. Where are you in your preparedness? Um, where are you in your community? So make this real for you. You'll get more out of it if you do. So I'm gonna turn it to Michael to carry on. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us so late on a, on a Friday. We certainly appreciate it. And it's uh, truly wonderful to be back um, in person. Um, uh, we all certainly uh, needed this break and to get to spend some time with all of you is, is truly a, a wonderful. Um, so disasters, one thing to think about is that they're equal opportunity. They, they impact everyone. Um, a, a disaster doesn't know whether you're young or whether you're older or whether you're an individual with a disability. Um, it doesn't know your socioeconomic standard, status. It doesn't know if you have resources or whether obtaining resources can be a struggle. Um, it doesn't know any boundaries. Um, however, even though it's equal opportunity, it does impact vulnerable populations the most, um, which makes us, especially here at APD, um, work on planning intensively uh, on resources that individuals with disabilities are able to access. Um, one of the biggest things to think about are what, are what are our risks. As Karen pointed out, clearly in Florida, we think a lot about hurricanes and weather events, and now we all have a pandemic first and foremost in our mind. Um, but there are other events too that can happen, but they're very unique to you, as Karen pointed out. So depending on where you live and, and how you live, uh, an impact, the impact of any event can, can be different, whether it's a flood or a fire or a hurricane um, or even tornadoes. We have those in Florida as well. One of the biggest things we have to think about is whether we're going to shelter at home, whether we're going to be able to stay in, our, in the comfort of our home, or whether we're going to evacuate. 
um, and deciding to leave our home um, can, can have some, some serious ramifications and, and frankly be dangerous unless we've really done some, some planning to make sure that we, we uh, can remain healthy and safe once we do so. Um, so while disasters are inevitable, um, there, there's no stopping them, um, we can have some control over how we look at the risks that we may be facing and then how we plan to address those, those risks. So let's talk a little bit about the impact of disasters on us and our communities. Obviously, when you think about um, it could affect food, it could affect whether we have potable water or whether we have water that needs to be boiled if it's not safe. Um, it affects shelter, where, where are we going to go or should we even go? And we're gonna talk a lot about sheltering um, in, a, in a few minutes, so we'll come back to that. But, you know, and let's think about the impact of COVID-19 on all of us. Um, it impacted food, it impacted water, it impacted power, uh, economic, social disruption. Um, so much happened um, in the last year and a half that we can learn from to help us be stronger as we face the natural disasters in Florida. Um, mobility uh, limitations. Um, if we think about hurricanes um, it, or floods, you know, if a hurricane causes flooding, you can't get out. You cannot go down your road. If there's debris, you can't, you can't move, you know. So mobility limitations. And, and people with special needs, the conditions deteriorate over time. We've seen it, whether you're in a shelter, whether you're stayed, you've stayed home, um, it gets worse over time. Um, and we're not even talking about the emotional um, and significant impact it has on us as we try to get through whatever emergency is that's befallen us. Um, you know, so some of the things that we need when we think about, if you've got pets, if you've got, um, you know, special uh, animals that take care of you, um, we need to plan for them. So we, when you think about all of the things on this slide, these are all the things we need to plan for. Um, and, and one of the things we're gonna talk about a little bit more is what are the resources that you have that you can bring to pair? And what are the resources in your specific community that can help you through it? Um, I do wanna say many, many disasters are just inconvenient. You know, they're inconvenient because we wonder what do we plan for? You know, if we plan for the most major of disasters, let's say a hurricane in Florida, all the other ones, we should be able to have a plan that will get us through it. Now, who would have known a public health emergency would have thrown a wrench into all of the planning that any of us have done? Um, but it did, and but we got through it. We are sitting here, um, and I, you know, I've been doing work in this disaster world for many, many years, many decades actually, um, and I, I see people, they, they're in shock at what happens, but they step up to the plate and they move on and they move f forward. But you know, we don't do it alone. We do it together. And we're gonna talk a lot about the disaster cycle getting into this, but um, one of the things disasters do, it brings out the best and the worst in all of us. Um, but ultimately, I think it brings out the best. People wanna get through it and people wanna help each other get, get through it. And that's people at all levels. You know, it's us as individuals, it's our families, it's our communities, it's our government agencies. And we'll talk about the roles of government agencies in a little bit. Um, but the only last thing I wanna talk about, uh, you know, on here is, is, is housing issues. Because one of the things that um, the major disasters create is a limitation in housing. Um, and we still, like if you think about Hurricane Michael in the Panhandle, people are still not in their own homes. So some disasters, the recovery it might last just a couple of days, could ha it could last years. Um, and I think what's important is that we keep our ears to the ground and we understand the, the effects of the, of the disaster and what it is we can do to move forward and who's gonna be part of that. In continuing to look at the impacts of disasters, um, 
we certainly learned how to cope dealing with, with COVID uh, for the past 14, 15 months. And, and being APD-centric, the, uh, the agency that we work for, um, these impacts were, were certainly felt by the individuals we all serve. Um, the loss of home-based services, many individuals that, that were used to having occupational therapy or speech therapy um, or behavior analysis come to their home, those services stopped during the pandemic and became virtual and became online. Um, individuals that were used to going to a day program um, and accessing some socialization, whether it's with a companion or a natural support, all of those services became interrupted. Um, and it took some time to work through that um, to give providers the tools that they needed um, and the, the access that they needed to be able to provide those services virtually. Um, and of course, that doesn't work for everyone, um, but we had to get through it the best that we could. Um, and we certainly learned a lot of lessons um, knock on wood, we never have to go through this again, but should we have to, we're, we're much better equipped having been through this and learned those lessons so that if we face those type of obstacles again, um, we'll have better planning in place. Um, isolation was, was a huge factor um, for all of us in this room during COVID. Um, I, I think of the, the many group homes that are in um, Suncoast region, uh, there are 520 of them, and when the pandemic first hit and things shut down, just like nursing homes and ALFs, those group homes weren't allowed um, to let family members and visitors into those homes. Um, and that was devastating, um, not only for the families, um, but for the individuals that they loved that were living in those group homes. So um, a tremendous challenge to, to not go to a day program and see 15 or 20 of your, your closest friends that you see Monday through Friday every week. And, and now all of a sudden, you may be able to see them on a computer screen, but that's certainly far, far different um, than what would be the norm. So isolation was, was really a, a very, very difficult um, um, factor to get through. Um, diminished natural supports I touched on, um, you know, the group homes having to limit um, families and then slowly as things were able to open up, um, we got through some new parameters where now families could visit but it had to be outside on a porch or in the backyard. There, there had to be steps along the way um, until we were finally able to get to a place where where residents could go home with families for, for extended weekends and outings and, and get back to that sense of normalcy. Um, interruption of medical care. Um, a lot of non-essential medical services ceased um, for months on end, where unless it was urgent and, and an emergency situation, um, routine medical care also went online, where medication management happened and they took care of routine issues, um, but getting in to see physicians became much more challenging. And then confusion is probably the biggest one. You know, not too many of us were around in 1918 for the last global pandemic that occurred. Um, so really from, from the highest of leadership all the way down to, to each one of us, this was all brand new. You know, and we really didn't know where to turn for facts. You know, there's lots of conflicting information remaining today. So there was a lot of confusion. Um, and one thing Karen likes to say a lot is if you've seen one disaster, you've seen one disaster. So whether you've lived through a hurricane or now we've all lived through a pandemic, should we end up in that situation again? Um, we can take some lessons from that, uh, but the factors may be very, very different um, and the impact may be very, very different. So confusion is really um, um, not a negative term. It's that we're, we're having to learn these lessons and, and coming out of this, um, we have a whole new drawer in our toolbox now uh, of just what to do if we're facing um, a, a medical situation where we have to isolate and stay away from each other. Um, so that's um, the last two slides have really highlighted the things we should think about as we're thinking about putting together our plan. Not all of them will apply to all of us. You know, you may have a, a solid shelter and have plenty of food and water and you don't have to evacuate. So those things really aren't gonna be part of your overall plan um, however, you may know someone or, or be power dependent, you know, and have a, a, a motorized wheelchair that must stay charged. Or you may be an individual that has a caregiver coming to your home to assist with activities of daily living, and those things could be interrupted. So those factors would go into your plan. So as you're considering what, what's going to be in there, be thinking about these potential impacts. I think one of the ways to really fight back against the confusion that Michael was talking about was really to understand the emergency management cycle. 
um, you know, it really is, it's a science. Emergency management is a science, inexact, because disaster is an inexact science. But I think it's important that, that we understand that this is the cycle in all disasters. This is what our federal government goes through, our state government goes through, our local governments goes through, and we are affected by that. And how well they go through this cycle um, has so much to do with how well we may recover and be able to respond. So um, one of the first things on there is preparedness. You know, let's, let's start with that. Um, that's the development of plans. The, you know, Michael's been talking about when you think about your own personal disaster plan, what does that look like? What should be in it? There's some great, great tools out there about putting a plan together. And I bet you everyone in this room already has one. Um, but if you haven't looked at it, since we've already begun hurricane season, which is June 1st, I would pick it up and look at it and say, does this make sense for me today in my living situation? It's very important that, that, that we do that. Um, and planning occurs at every level. It's personal, looking at your own personal disaster plan. Every municipality, every county government, every state government has a comprehensive emergency management plan. And, you know, of course, the federal government, FEMA, the, you know, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, they do as well. And all of those plans affect us, you know, and so it's really important that we understand that. Um, because a lot of times, you know, no, t no two disasters are alike, and the kind of resources that we will have that will come into our communities are not the same. You cannot say, well, this is what happened in Hurricane Irma. Therefore, if we have a hurricane in 2021, that's exactly the same thing that's going to happen by way of resources c coming into my community. It is not. And that's why it's so important that we stay informed. It's the only way to mitigate confusion when it comes to that. Um, the other thing that's important is know where you live. Do you live near a river that floods often? Are you on the coast? Do you, are you living in an evacuation zone? Do you know what your evacuation zones are? You know, if you look at a map of your county, where are they? Do you know where the public shelters are? You know, what, what are you looking at? And um, there's no two people in this room, unless you live together, um, who has the same shelter plans, the same evacuation zone, the same house. Do you know, you know, does your, does your home withstand wind and water? Do you know that? Um, so it's important for us to understand what that is, and all of those things will have a lot to do with the level of preparedness that we are that we are really needing to do. And then the next is response, and the red, um, and that's really life safety decisions. That's where emergency managers and and police officer officers and and fire and EMTs, they are responding to the emergency. It's already happened. They are looking at life safety issues. They're not looking at what could make, it make things con more convenient for people. They are talking about saving lives. And, and I think that's important that we all remember that because that is the number one thing that they need to do in response. Um, it's looking at sheltering and food. You know, if you think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs triangle, that bottom rung, that's shelter, a roof over your head, food, water, safety issues. And that's during response in an emergency, that's what they're looking at. Um, sometimes that even could be, when you think about food, it could be MREs or meals ready to eat. Um, I don't know if you've ever had them. They're better than they used to be, but they're not great. But you know what? If it's going to save someone's life, let's have at it, you know. And um, some counties will have to because during response, if there's no grocery stores open, you can't go out and get anything, um, they're going to set up what's called points of distribution or pods. And it's when the mercantile system, the grocery stores, the Walmarts, they're shut down. They, there's no power. They can't open. Yet people still need something. They need water. Or they might need, you know, some very basic necessities. They'll set those up. And, and if you live in Florida, you know you've probably seen a pod somewhere at some time. 
Um, and so that's, that's part of the response. And then the next in, in green is recovery. Um, that includes things like debris removal or emergency housing assistance, health and social services, helping us get through it, you know, helping us get back to some semblance of normalcy. We know that it's taken us a long time to get there with COVID, and we're not there yet. I mean, we're still wearing masks. We're still washing our hands. I, I have to give a whole lot of credit to the, fam to the uh, Family Cafe for wanting to keep people safe, but still allowing us to be together. So, um, but that's recovery. And, and a lot happens during recovery. If it's a little storm, it might happen in a couple of days. But as I said, using um, Hurricane Michael as an example, um, they're still recovering in the panhandle. It's taking a long time. They're still recovering in the Keys from Hurricane Irma. You know, that's years of recovery. Um, so different things will happen depending upon the nature of the emergency. And then the last one is, is mitigation. And that is, you know, what can we do to lessen the effects of a disaster? You know, it's, it's understanding the risks, it's mitigating the level of damage, um, trying to make sure that we don't lose any more than we possibly could lose because of the nature of an emergency. And, and of course, government plays a, a large role in, in response, um, both local, state, and of course, federal. Um, another thing I've learned from Karen, which I've learned a lot, is that all disasters are local. And that means that having a relationship with emergency management in the county in which you live is very unique because of the 67 counties that we have in Florida, each one of them has an emergency management office and each of the conditions and the resources and the capabilities of those um, counties are different. You know, what may be true in Lee County or may not be true in Pinellas County or Orange County or Miami-Dade. And, and we really encourage families and, and support providers um, and individuals to have a relationship with that emergency management office so that you know what resources are available um, and to communicate with them on needs that you may have. Uh, and that's their role is, is to identify what resources may be there to, to fill those needs. Um, and of course, your local management is going to be your first responders, your fire department, your police department, your EMTs, um, those are going to be the, the boots on the ground, those that are helping with evacuations and shelters. So truly, while the whole state or the whole country or in the case of COVID, the whole world is impacted, truly where it impacts you is where you live. Um, I, I was fortunate to do a, a brief internship um, at an emergency management office. Um, and, and one thing they would remark is on those blue sky sunny days, it was rare that they would hear from, from anyone. You know, of course, they would have their, their work and go about their business. But, you know, as soon as a, a hurricane was coming and now Florida is in the cone of uncertainty, um, now the phones are ringing off the hook and the emails are flying. And, and really the, the time to reach out to them and have those conversations where you're going to get that individual attention um, is in the wintertime when we're not having hurricanes or, or when we're not looking at an imminent danger in front of us. So I, I really encourage you to have that relationship with, the, your, with your local emergency management. And then of course the next level is the state um, and that's assisting those local governments, all 67 of those emergency management departments. They're reporting up to Tallahassee um, where there's an emergency operations center. Um, this is something at APD that, that we, we live uh, um, often whenever we have an emergency where myself in the Suncoast region, we are gathering information, whether it's group homes or family homes or individuals in supported living, and we're communicating um, to our emergency officer, Karen, who is then making sure that the emergency operations center has that information. Um, and it, it's something that um, through practice, we, we've gotten quite good at, I must say, where our our lines of communication, um, we're able to triage problems and, and get answers back down um, to the, the local community so that we can address those needs. And of course, the state government is the entity that can then communicate with the federal government um, and request that disasters be declared. Um, the state government can also issue emergency orders to, to address needs of, in the state. Um, and the state governor is the only individual that, that can request 
um, that the president declare a local disaster, which of course frees up resources. Um, and you may even hear at times that those declarations come before a storm hits. And it's for that very purpose, to unlock resources so that they can be staged throughout the state and we can be even faster when it is time to respond. So let's break down preparedness real quickly. This is what this means to be prepared. It starts with getting a plan. And those are just a couple of links, you know, floridadisaster.org, Red Cross has a plan, there's fill in the blank plans. We have a fill in the blank personal disaster plan on our APD CARES website. Um, if you haven't put one together, look at it. You just have to, it'll ask you questions and prompt you, and it'll make you think, you know, oh my gosh, I didn't even think about that. But fill it in and then just post it on your refrigerator during hurricane season. Um, the other part of preparedness, get your supplies together. Michael's going to talk to you about what should be in your disaster supply kit, and that information is out there. It's all over the place. Just grab it put it together, and if you have one and you haven't looked at it for a year, go in there and see what it's, what's expired and replace it um, with something else. And, you know, Michael was talking about knowing your community resources, and every community is different. Every, every community's resources are different. We're going to talk about shelters in a minute. Some computers, uh, com some communities, excuse me, have one shelter because they're a coastal community and they don't have any buildings that will withstand wind and water. Some have 150 shelters, you know, so all, all communities are different. And I will tell you, depending on what county you, you live in, go online and say emergency, you know, Lee County Emergency Management, Orange County Emergency Management, and look at their websites. They're really good. I would say all 67 counties in Florida, they all have an emergency management website and they will tell you, they will give you information about what those community resources are. Um, and I'm gonna stay, say it first here and we're gonna say it again. Um, it's also where you'll register for a special needs shelter if that is one of your options. Um, and I, you know, communicate your plan to family and caregivers, You're, you know, if you, if you have developed that plan, don't just you be the only person that knows what's in there. You know, let the people that you care about know what, what is in there. If, if something that's in there it, is a, it's an expectation that someone's going to do something for you, say, you know, my neighbor's going to pick me up and bring me to a hotel, or um, make sure they know that. A lot of times we put plans together and we never inform the people that are in those plans about what we're expecting of them. If you have a caregiver or if you are a caregiver, make sure that, um, that you have talked to each other about what is in those plans and what your availability is. You know, often, and we've seen this in many a hurricane event, um, some of our uh, consumers, they expected their caregiver to be available, yet their caregiver lost their home. Um, it's a sad situation and that's why plan B and plan C are so important. It can't just be one option. It's like in the world of options, what are all the things that I might be able to do? And listing them is critical to success and in some cases survival. Um, and update your plan annually. That's what we're talking about. Dust it off, update it update your contact information, um, you know, all of that. Update your, your prescription information. Uh, the fill-in-the-blank plans are great. They will drive you to find information to place in that plan, and you can sleep better at night knowing that you've thought that through. You really can. And so just a little bit about disaster supply kits, because as Karen mentioned, uh, this information is readily available, whether you use a, a website, or I was in Lowe's the other day, they had a large display with, with checklists that you could take with you um, of items that you would want to think about to have in your disaster plan. The same is with grocery stores. So this information really is just to get you thinking. Of course, everyone's kit is going to have some similarities, but it will have some differences as well. Um, one of the things that really jumps out to me on this is food for individuals with dietary restrictions. Um, a, a common misconception is that if you do go to a shelter and you have dietary needs, um, that they'll be able to accommodate that. 
and in most cases that's that's not true um, they, you know they're going to have food and water but if you have specific dietary needs that's something that you would have to address yourself um, so that's something that that jumps out that folks don't always think about um, Snack foods, if you have teenagers like me, you know they've eaten them all um, by the time September or October rolls around. So you do have to revisit those and make sure that you have ample supplies. Um, the rest is, is pretty common of things that you expect to see. Um, one thing that we talk with our supported living coaches about um, is these items can get expensive, you know, and it, it, can, it can be really difficult to have flashlights and batteries and all this food. And, and we try to talk about making this a year long um, project, you know, every time you, you go to Walmart or the dollar store or Publix, um, that you're getting a little bit at a time, knowing that in June, the goal is to have a full kit. Um, the other thing we, we talk about is sometimes combining resources. Um, there may be an individual that's willing to be a host home, and so other individuals that you know or you serve uh, may be able to go to that home and they can share resources instead of everyone buying all of the individual items. That's something that they can can plan for together and, and save themselves some, some funding to, to handle things little by little. And this is just the rest of some other things to think about, obviously coming through COVID-19, PPE, personal protective equipment, it's important to have masks and hand sanitizer and things like that in, in your kit. And um, again, a lot of this is very, um, just common sense, cleaning supplies, any special items, because we're all special. We all have special needs of one sort or another. Um, um, so be thinking about that cash. A lot of times, if the power goes down, the ATMs go down. So having cash is really important. Um, <laughs> I know. Well, we all want cash, but it is, it's good to have some just in case you can't get your hands on, on it later on. Um, important documents that, that you have, waterproof container, or even a Ziploc bag. You know, anything that in case you are out in the elements that um, will, will um, not ruin them. Um, and then that goes on to list some of those important documents you might want to include in there. If you have children, toys, books, and games, um, pet care items. You know, we don't want pets to stay home when, and you've left. We really, you know, um, service animals and pets, if you can bring them with you and if you can plan for them, um, you really need to do that. Um, every county has to have a pet shelter plan. It's important you find out what your county is if you've got a pet and, and bring them with you and bring the, the food with you as, as well or anything that they might need. Um, and so, and that's important. Uh, and there's a good list there, but you'll find these lists, you know, in a, in a lot of different places and in a lot of, res you know, sources online. All right, then just a little bit on response, which goes back to the cycle of emergency management that Karen was addressing. Um, a response is when now you've thought about your risks, you've made a plan to address those risks, and now this is when you're putting that plan into action. Um, and on the community level, you're seeing those first responders um, uh, address the needs of that particular community. You're seeing the fire and the police and the EMTs and the emergency management staff that are out in the community addressing whatever impact may have happened in that community. Um, power outages are very likely. Um, before a storm, you'll often see where power companies start calling in trucks and supplies and staff from other states and staging them around um, Florida to anticipate that there's going to be power outages so that they can address them as quickly as possible. Um, healthcare facilities may see a surge. Um, individuals that were able to be healthy and safe in their home on a blue sky sunny day, as soon as things are compromised and perhaps they're without power or without essential items, now they're going to need skilled care. So you may see emergency rooms become overrun. Um, other resources such as walk-in clinics and urgent care clinics may not be open um, due to safety concerns. Um, you'll, you may also see infrastructure challenges, which means roads, bridges. Um, th there may be a boil water notice, which can be particularly challenging if you don't have any power. Um, again, emergency management really plays the lead role here, um, and they're gathering all that information on the impact of that community where you live, and they're getting it up that communication chain so that the Emergency Operations Center in Tallahassee can begin to, to coordinate responses and triage those issues. 
and then we talked about recovery earlier, but a little bit more, because this is where we're spending all of our time after an emergency is, is in recovery. And um, there's always a lot of questions about what's going on. And that's why that communication that Michael was talking about from, from you to, to the counties, to the state is so critical. And, you know, at APD, you know, we're talking twice a day. If it's a major emergency, a major hurricane, we're making sure that we're talking twice a day because, you know, it's like Michael and his team and his counterparts around the state and their teams who are communicating with um, our clients. They're communicating with the waiver co support coordinators. They're hearing about unmet needs. And it is really important that everybody at the State Emergency Operations Center knows what the unmet needs are. It's important that your county emergency managers know what they are because what they want to do is meet those unmet needs. But if we don't know that they're there, nothing can be done about it. So it's important that you raise the issues and so that we can problem solve. I mean, that's what really this is all about. You see the FEMA banner there, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, but not, not all disasters have a presidential declaration. Um, and even if we do have a presidential declaration, FEMA it doesn't always turn on all of their programs. It really depends upon the amount of damage um, and the severity and the unmet needs and the individuals who are impacted. And that's why damage assessment um, is so important, whether it's physical damage assessment to the infrastructure or it's unmet needs of the citizens in any given community. It has to be fed up you know, through the ranks. Um, I know that Michael and, if, and his team, I will never know the problems that they, saw, they solved on the local level during COVID. And I know it was huge. I know we were solving them at the state level and it was huge, but they were every single day. But sometimes it gets right down to you as an individual and what are the problems you are facing that can be solved by, um, whether it's our, our community, local community, our state community, if you will, or even the federal government. So knowing what you're, what you're going through is really important. Um, and so recovery, we've already talked about a lot of that. Information is critical. Um, I'm gonna really praise our communication team. We've got a great website on the APD CARES website. And um, quite a few years ago, I don't know how many, Melanie, maybe three years ago, maybe more, um, we, we developed a disaster recovery toolkit. And as information comes about it, with every disaster, we keep adding it to that. There's links, there's guidance documents. Um, also, your county emergency management agency will put up-to-date information um, in there as well. Um, you'll see information centers um, pop up, you know, 800 numbers, call centers, because information is key to us being able to recover. And I can't say enough about how important it is that we're coordinating together, we're communicating together, we're coordinating together, it is critical. And you need to know that it's not just emergency management at every level, it's all the state agencies. It's, you know, APD and ACA and the Department of Children and Families and the Department of Health and the Division of Emergency Management. It's all the different agencies that are at the, at the State Emergency Operations Center coordinating together. We get a printout every day of, of power outages, you know, and then we see, them, we see the power coming online. Um, and if any of you have gone through power outage, you know that over time it is, it is just awful. And you know that you just wanna see the light at the end of that tunnel and you wanna know that it's gonna come on. And um, so there's really, there's a sense of urgency throughout this. Um, but we will spend most of our time, all of us, in recovery after a major, after a major event. And then the fourth part of the emergency management cycle is mitigation. And really what mitigation means is that we recognize that we, we can't prevent all disasters. Um, we can't stop that hurricane from coming. But what we can do are take measures ourselves to limit how that hurricane will impact us. Um, it, it can happen on an individual level, again, to return to, to folks that are in, in supported living or even individuals moving into a group home, you can start to think about, well, is, what's the evacuation zone that, that I'm thinking of renting this apartment in? Um, how close is it to a body of water? Is it likely to flood? 
Um, are there trees and other, and other projectiles that could be a problem if there's a storm? And those are things to think about if you really, at, at our suggestion, want to stay out of public shelters. Um, and if you really want to be able to shelter in place, those are the things you want to think about um, before you, you make any moves. Um, local government is doing the same thing. You know, they're learning lessons from past events. If areas are prone to flooding, then they're, they're going to look at drainage infrastructure and how they can make changes so that those areas that, that may flood on a, just a regular Florida thunderstorm um, don't become very, very dangerous when we have a lot of rain coming in. They also look at building codes. You know, we, we're all aware of hurricane clips and things like that that came into use after Hurricane Andrew back in the 90s. Um, those things happen all the time where um, local government is looking at what building code should be changed so that we will be as safe as possible in our, in our homes. And, it, and it's all for that last bullet point is that we want to be as resilient as possible. Uh, we want to limit those impacts so that we don't get to where life is being uh, placed in jeopardy, um, that we're taking valuable lessons and, and not just writing them down um, in the aftermath of any event, but that we're actually using that information to, to affect change. So let's talk about sheltering. Um, in Florida, there's two types of shelter. There's a general population shelter and there's a special needs shelter. And it's often confusing to people about where should I go? Should I even go to a shelter? I'm, and I'm just gonna talk about general population shelters and Michael's gonna um, really get into the special needs shelters, the differences between them, your considerations when you, when you think about what you need to do. But a general popula population shelter, first of all, it, in your county, if you have a public shelter, it means that the building will withstand wind and water. Um, that's the first and foremost consideration. Um, but it is still, we look at it as a last resort, as a lifeboat. Remember we were talking about plan A, plan B, plan C. You need to think of all of your options. This shouldn't be your first option. It's noisy, it's hot, um, it's, you know, it, now, generally, they're 10 to 20 square feet per person. If, if you've ever, if you wanted to map that out, it's not very big. And then during COVID, there's many counties that want to make it that space a little bit more because of the importance of social distancing. Um, <clears throat> and, and they're going to up to as many as 110 square feet per person. The problem then, of course, means that they can't allow as many people in those shelters and so that's where our personal responsibility comes into play we do need to think about alternatives to going to a to a public shelter um, and it's just basic first aid it's usually run by volunteers it might be run by um, county employees um, and and it's really a lifeboat it's getting you out of the elements that's truly what it's about um, limited food and comforts um, and then what was interesting if you look at Hurricane Irma there were 700 shelters with 192,000 people in them Hurricane Michael we only saw 44 shelters and 6,500 people but Hurricane Michael was much more devastating in you know, in the panhandle than a lot of areas that were affected in, than in Hurricane Irma. So it's not really, there was, a, but it was so much more widespread, which is why there were so many more people in, the, in those shelters. Um, and so then what's, what's on the bottom, what that link is, it's www.floridadisaster.org, and that's where you can plan and prepare, and it's got a, shelter, a lot of information on sheltering. Sometimes counties will not publicize their general population shelters until an event occurs. Um, they may want to, not, some counties will open them all at the same time. Some will want to open them only one at a time. Um, some, they don't want to publicize it because if, if usually they're in schools, as you know, and if they're working on it, it can't go up as a shelter. So um, that's why keeping in touch with your emergency management office, even looking at their website is so important. And listening to, um, listening to your radio station, you know, to know whether or not you even have to evacuate. And, and one thing that I do want to make sure that I say is, if you know your home and you know that you're not in an evacuation zone and you're not being called upon to evacuate, it's possible the very safest place for you to be is to stay home. Um, but you need to be aware. And I think we all need to be aware in the midst of a storm. And then moving on to special needs shelters, 
Um, I always found this to be, be very interesting because it's, it's very difficult to stand here and tell you exactly what you can expect um, when, you, when you register for a special needs shelter. Um, as I mentioned, Florida, we have 67 counties and, and each county's capabilities and their resources for their special needs program are different. Um, you know, I think in, in our world that, that we all live in, when we think of special needs, we're, we're thinking of individuals that we support with, that have developmental disabilities. And that's not always what emergency management in any given county is thinking. They're also thinking of, of medical needs. They're, they're thinking of that individual who's medically fragile or on a dialysis machine or has, is oxygen dependent. Um, if you're an individual that has personal support services in your home, um, you would need to bring a personal support service person with you um, you would have that conversation with your, your county emergency management to see what they could provide for you, um, but it's, it's quite unlikely that they would have personal support staff there that could address someone's uh, um, ADLs each and every day that they're, that they're there. Um, it's, it's like Karen mentioned, it's really your last resort that it may be part of your plan, so we would never discourage you from registering for a special needs shelter. Um, once you do so, you'll be getting a call from your, your local emergency management team, and they'll want to have a, a deeper discussion with you to really drill down on, on what your needs may be. Um, and I've seen in my experiences times where instead of a shelter, they instead link with a, a nursing home or another skilled center because the needs of the individual aren't going to be met, even in a special needs shelter, and they need a higher level of care. But that emergency management team doesn't know those things until you submit your registration and have that discussion with them so that they know what you need and they're able to tell you what they're able to provide. Um, and, and I mentioned earlier, that's something you really want to do as early as possible. That's, that's not something you want to do when, you know, we're three, four days away from an event that's predictable um, because, you know, they're not large teams in my experience. They're, they're smaller offices and they get overwhelmed when hundreds and thousands of individuals are calling and wanting information. So make that a part of your plan that you're doing well before we find ourselves in, in hurricane season. And the other, the other thing that I think is important, people think that if they register once for a special needs shelter, they don't have to register again every year, and that's not true. You need to fill out that registration form every single year. And by the way, that shelter registry is a statewide shelter registry. You can get to it from the state emergency management website, from the Department of Health website, because Department of Health is really responsible for special needs shelters. And you can get to it from your county emergency management website. It's the same registry. And I think that's important. So if you have not registered, please do that. Yes. Um, you, the question is, in, in, in the county she's talking about, that there are certain um, situations that would not allow someone to be able to go to a special needs shelter. Um, and every county is a little bit different. So the registry is statewide, but the county capacity is different. And let's take questions in just a few minutes. We'll get through these, and then we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, because I think it's an important question. Her point is well taken, though every county's capacity is a little bit different. So registering is critical, whether or not you can get there or not. And that's also why you wanna have plan B, C, and D and alternatives. Um, and these are some other alternatives. When you're not in an, ac in an evacuation zone, you might be able to stay home. Um, know your zone, know your home, what, how strong your home is. Um, you know, our group homes, our APD licensed group homes, they use a host home approach. We've seen some wonderful successes where they will already communicate with an, in, say it's a, a coastal group home. They'll communicate with a group home that's inland, that's safer, and they know that that's the plan. They will, if they have to evacuate that group home, they will go into the host home. Um, and we've seen a lot of great examples of combining resources, um, sharing staff, 
Um, but it's those conversations. It's those conversations that are so important that literally can save lives. You know, so I, I would just encourage you to have them, whether it's personal or whether we're talking about um, a group living situation. Then a little bit about evacuation. Um, I think if we just think back in recent history with, with Irma and with Michael in, in 2018, um, we saw pretty much an evacuation nightmare where thousands of people decided to, um, that their new plan was to hit the road and, and get out of Dodge. Um, but it, it created uh, massive traffic jams where individuals would say it took them 14 hours to go from Orlando to Jacksonville, you know, on their way to evacuate to Savannah. And, and just on a personal level, I would always wonder just exactly how they decided that that was the best place to evacuate to. Um, you know, Florida is only about 160 miles wide in most spots, and then, you know, 350 or so when you go across the Panhandle. Some of those storms we see them on radar. You know, they're huge. So I don't, I, I don't always know the wisdom of, of saying, well, I'm out of here, and I'm going to jump in my car and just hope for the best. Um, you know, we saw a lot of, of problems with gas stations where individuals were worried about running out, so they were stopping every, every chance that they got. And of course, that creates a, a gas shortage. Um, they would arrive in a new place, you know, they'd decide to go to the panhandle, but as the storms tend to do, now it has turned, and now all the hotels are full up in that area, and now they're having to access public shelters, which of course don't have the capacity to handle thousands and thousands of folks um, in our more rural areas. So really, it, it's really key to, to try to do a very good plan by assessing those risks and then sticking to your plan, evacuating may be part of your plan, but you certainly want to know where you're going and that you have a safe place to, to stay once you, once you get there. Um, having no plan is, is, is the most dangerous of all. We thought it was important that you understand the role that we play because, and we could put any of the state agencies' roles in there. You know, our commitment are to the people that we serve and those who serve them. Um, and we do have a comprehensive emergency management plan. It talks about how we're going to do business, what's essential, because we have some very essential services that we provide that have to continue for the for our consumers. Um, and it, it identifies our plan. We think about if our, our headquarters, whether it's a regional office, whether it's a state office, if it was affected, where are we going to work so we can continue to serve um, our consumers? Um, we, we have someone, a designated rep at the State Emergency Operations Center. Remember getting back to how important it is that we keep, we keep talking with our staff and, and with our um, providers. Um, and that we communicate essential information to, to the folks. Um, getting back to the, the need for up-to-date information, we push it out on the website, we hold conference calls, um, and we, we solve problems onesie-twosies, one-on-one, -on -one, or we'll solve statewide problems, but we can't do it alone. We do it together um, with the partners at the state EOC. Um, and we work with our partner ag agencies, the ARCs, the, you know, FARF, the, you know, Developmental Disability Council, the Centers for Independent Living, you know, all of the folks, they're all there working together to try to solve the problems so that we can help our folks recover. Um, and we problem solve through that entire disaster cycle. We're still problem solving from COVID, mm. you know, every single day. So um, it's, it's just good. I'm glad that we can do that, and we're going to continue to do that. In, in order to problem solve, we really need good information. Um, speaking a little bit about Suncoast region, um, all, and all of the licensed homes, really, for that matter, for APD, they all are required to do a comprehensive emergency management plan, and we have group home monitors and licensing staff that provide technical assistance and then ultimately review that plan before that home is relicensed for another year. Um, and then shifting to supported living, in Suncoast we ask all of the supported living providers to send us two lists every May and June. So we're, we're right in the middle, or nearing the end of that now. The first list is a listing of their management and all of their employees, um, how many individuals they serve, and in what counties. And then the second list they send us are a list of the individuals that they serve. Um, very basic demographic information, a little bit about their plan, shelter in place, evacuate, 
um, host home, something simple like that, um, so that we have some semblance uh, of everyone in supported living that, that has thought this through and has a plan. And we also require um, waiver support coordinators to have those discussions with individuals that live in the family home or individuals that are in independent living. That's their living in their own home in the community without the assistance of a supported living coach. Um, and the reason that we do this is really so that we have sufficient information so that when an event hits in the emergency operations center and Karen and her team start asking questions, we can get them the data that they need so that we can solve the problem. Um, just recently, um, some of you may have heard of the issues in Piney Point, um, which was that wastewater um, that was being stored um, over in Manatee, Sarasota area. And when that leak first hit the news, they were saying it could be an 18 foot wall of wastewater that was going to flood a certain section of, of that county. So no longer had I seen that on the TV when the phone rang and I knew what the question was going to be. How many group homes do you have in that zone that could be flooded and how many individuals in supported living? And if we didn't have these emergency planning exercises that we do with the providers, I wouldn't be able to provide that answer. I wouldn't know the risk and would have no chance of, of addressing the impact until well after it's occurred. Um, thankfully, none of that happened, um, but it just shows the, the true importance of gathering that information so that we can have effective communication um, with our leads in Tallahassee, and then they can get us um, the resources that we need to address them. Um, and it's, it's something that, that works very, very well, and it's behind the scenes. It's not something you're going to see on the news or in the newspaper, um, but it's something that, that's very, very effective. So real quick, um, these are just some resources for response and recovery that's important for you to know about. And you know, we're talking about the Agency for Persons with Disabilities, but I will tell you, every state agencies are, are talking about these kinds of planning for the people that they serve. Um, so there's a lot going on behind the scenes. Um, and so these are just some of the resources and some of the um, websites that, that we have. And we're gonna continue to communicate out you know, important information. And this is just, you can't read it probably from the back, but these are just two screenshots of our, the toolkit I was talking about. You know, like for example, on the right hand side, Gas Buddy. You know, when we, were, when we didn't have gas, remember when that thing that just happened, um, I forgot, the, you know, and all of a sudden people are worried that they're not gonna be able to get gas. Well, Gas Buddy was a great link. So Melanie and her team and John, they put it up. You know, and, and every single major emergency we see in the state, we are adding to this website so that people can have up-to-date information. It is really what is gonna help us through. And I know we're right at the end here because we're right up against five o'clock. And this is a bit of a summary slide, which really just drives home the point of being disaster ready and, and taking away those three important themes that no one size fits all. If you've seen one disaster, you've seen one disaster. They're all unique. The conditions that we all have when we're affected by a, a disaster are unique, um, that we know our counties. Um, I couldn't stress that more, that um, wherever you live, you want to become familiar with who your emergency managers are and just what their resources and capabilities are. And then taking an all hazards approach. Um, Another good thing you can do with a lot of counties is sign up for their alerts um, and you, you'll get text messages or emails when they have something that's going on. And it could just be that there's a main line water break, um, something minor like that, or, or of course larger scale issues, but they have good lines of communication set up that, that you can access. Um, we covered resources extensively from everything from to-go kits um, to the role that, that local, state, and, and federal government plays. Um, and then there's some good information on the website, as Karen pointed out. There's a template for our group homes to use for their emergency plans, um, as well as APD personal disaster plans, if you wish to, to access them. And so go back and look at your plan. It's a living document, ever-changing. When, when your situations change, it needs to you know, change in your plan. 
Um, make sure if there's a role that some of the people are playing that you've listed in your plan, make sure they know about that role and make sure you communicate that um, and practice it. Sometimes if you think about if something happens in another state, in Louisiana, there's a hurricane, say, what would happen if that happened to me in my community? What would I be doing? It's a great way to kind of think through how your plan works. All right, then lastly, you know, we covered a lot. We only had an hour to speak. We could certainly go on. Um, but the takeaways really are to assess your risks, um, plan to, on how you're going to address those risks, and what resources will you need in order to put that plan into action. Um, disasters are going to happen, um, but what we have control over is how we plan and how we communicate um, before, during, and after an event um, so that we can mitigate the impact on, on ourselves and those we care for. So. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Yes. Phil Donahue. I wrote it down. Hi. <laughs> so my name is Kat Sullivan. I'm a pediatric registered nurse administrator, and we take care of medically fragile kids in Florida. Um, we have been trying to plan for this year's hurricane for them, but have been unable to successfully complete their plan because special needs shelters in Florida will not accept a patient that requires a hospital bed or that is ventilator dependent. Hospitals in 2020 refused for the first time to admit our patients, citing liability reasons. So the hospitals are no longer helping us, and 63 out of 67 counties in Florida do not have a plan for our children. Um, the challenge with our children is that they are life support dependent, so any storm that has the ability to knock out power is a threat to the lives of the kids. Many of our families have been compensating for the lack of Florida's planning for them, and they have, when they have the financial ability, have purchased generators. You just listed there that gas shortages are something that happen exceptionally when there are bad storms making landfall because everyone panics. And so, it is hurricane season. Our kids do not have a plan. I am out of compliance with ACA and other state regulating agencies because I am required as a registered nurse administrator to ensure that our families have a plan. And so I'm here today because 32 families in Central Florida have no plan and there are tens of thousands of these kids. It is very dangerous. Um, we've been speaking with the medical coalition um, and their response is that the counties have refused to adopt a plan that they've created. The Medical Coalition is a federally funded organization that every state is required to have. And I've been having discussions with their executive director. There's no, there's no back and forth. Counties are refusing, hospitals are refusing. I'd love to have a conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't go away so we can get your information later, you know, so we can, well, you know, it's funny, earlier this, earlier this week, I know that we're not taping anymore, but earlier this week we did meet with the Department of Health, you know, and we were kind of just talking about a lot of the things Michael and I were, were talking about and how important it is that we do problem solve, and it is a county by county capacity issue um, statewide. So these are the kind of things we need to keep working on. So thank you so much for, for bringing that to, to the attention of everyone. Absolutely. It's the same registry, all right? It's a statewide special needs registry. You can get in through your county website or the state website, but it's the same website. It's a test. It's, and so you need to just go in and fill out your information. But so. Then will they, after she does that, have a conversation with her? Is it possible that they will allow it? You know, 
it is possible, and but it depends on the resources of that particular county. That that's the difference. Some counties have transportation resources. Some counties do not. Um, some counties, I, I'm going to say, some counties might even have some some special beds in their special needs shelters, and other counties just do not. But you won't know that until you register. One of the things that I, I and I know from talking to the Department of Health this week, in fact, earlier this week, um, it's important that they understand what the needs are of people out there. Um, you may not want to go, but it's important that they know that you're there in, in their community. And the emergency manager wants to know that you're there because they're very interested in the, in the welfare of their citizens. So I, it, it is a good idea to register. Yes, ma'am. If you register, let's say my daughter is 26, and I register for, for a special needs shelter, do I have to take her there? Am I obligated to take her there during a shelter? No. Can I keep her at home? Absolutely. 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 We need to register to even try to get there if need be. Right. Yeah. I mean, I've seen people try to register last minute, and it can be done, but boy, it's a whole lot easier for the team in your county, like the health department and the emergency managers, to plan if you register in advance. But no, it doesn't obligate you to, to go. They won't let you register in Alaska County. So you're saying register. Yeah. I would want to get on a computer to, to try to get in, because they, they let everybody can register. You can so that is the county by county decision about what they can accommodate in in, in the shelter. There, yeah, I think if you can if you can register, um, you should. It's the same registry. They're linked together. Maybe you can. No, no, Alachua may, you know, and I'm not familiar with Alachua County, but they may have a, a limited number of beds available mm -hmm. in a special needs shelter. So right. they have to decide, you know, who is, who's best going to meet the criteria to, to access that special needs shelter. And you mentioned you didn't want to go. So if you can safely, you know, hunker down at home and be safe and have what you need to stay healthy, um, you, you're not forced to register, but as, as this other, um, parents said, in order to have any, you know, shot of accessing that shelter if you needed it, you you would have to register. I'd like to be on the registry for special needs because I know David has special needs. Yeah. I, anyway, I'm surprised you're told you can't not, register. I'm sorry, I'm bad. I'm bad. No, you're, you're not. not bad. You're not. No. I think this is a great example of needing to problem solve that yeah. that special situation yeah. with because DOH. with yeah. with DOH absolutely. Yeah. Um, so okay. so I, I I would like to talk to you after yeah. if that would be okay. So, but we are in it together, and it, it's a lot it's of a it's a lot of trying to find solutions to everybody's individual problems. So thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you guys.